Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, a friend, uh, a remarkable woman who has accomplished a great deal both in her diplomatic career and now in a very active and influential academic career. Uh, Jendai Frazier joined the Carnegie Mellon University faculty in, in January 2009. Uh, she is the head of the Center, the International Center for International Innova Policy Innovation. I'm, I'm, that's what I'm drawing. Um, also, dis a distinguished services professor. She has very elastic legs because she has one foot in D.C. and one foot in Pittsburgh, uh, where she teaches in both places and maybe next year Kigali, all simultaneously. <laughs> it's the marvels of global technology. Uh, she served as special assistant to the President of the United States and senior director for African Affairs at the National Security Council from 2001 to 2004. She became the first woman U.S. Ambassador to South Africa in June of 2004. She then returned to the State Department in, in 2005, in August of that year, as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. You may note there's some connection to another woman of some note uh, named Condoleezza Rice, <laughs> for with whom she worked both at the NSC and at the State Department. At her time in state, she is widely credited for her work in bringing an end to conflict in the Congo, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Burundi, and for helping resolve Kenya's 2007 post-election crisis. And much of that legacy has found its way into your latest book about looking at violence in elections in Africa, based on a conference in 2010 that you hosted. She received the Distinguished Service Award from, the Secretary, from Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and the Dame Grand Commander in the Humane Order of African Redemption from Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, another remarkable woman in our world. She received her bachelor's degree, two master's degrees, and her PhD in political science from Stanford University. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great personal pleasure and privilege and honor to introduce Ambassador Jendai Frazier. Good evening to all of you. It's a true pleasure to be here. And Sky, let me thank you very much for uh, your hospitality and for taking me to see the Garden of the Gods and um, just being a good friend over all these years. And I want to thank all of you for coming out this evening and um, especially the past president, Larry. Um, it's inspiring to know that you were in Sierra Leone in the 1960s. Uh, uh, that college was one of the best in Africa. And so it's, it's good to meet somebody who was there when Sierra Leone was what it should have been, right? And hopefully will be again as it recovers from civil war. But thank you all again very much for being here. And what I'm going to do, my topic this evening is Africa's next decade. And to be honest with you, I approach this subject with some caution since Africa is a very diverse continent. There's more than a billion people living in Africa's 54 countries, um, belonging to more than 3,300 ethnic groups, speaking over 2,000 distinct languages in a land mass of 11.7 million square miles. Basically, three, US, uh, the three of the continental U.S. will fit into Africa. It's a huge continent, and it's a lot of people. Um, and so to talk about Africa um, without recognizing that diversity is um, foolish. <laughs> so, I want to, you know, give myself that, uh, you know, th that recognition that um, this really is going to be at what we would call the 6,000, you know, 6,000 mile range, or you know, it's going to be very broad overview. And then in the Q and A, we can get into specific cases. Um, so it's really about the trends in Africa, the broad trends. And I thought I would focus on key areas of U.S. interests. What are the drivers and what are the barriers to progress over the next decade? Um, and I'm looking at three specific areas, economic growth and development, which is a key priority for the U.S. across all administrations, governance and stability, 
and peace and security. And because I believe in always being transparent, I'll tell you what my, my uh, con conclusions are before I give you my presentation. Um, I think that the key drivers of progress on the continent will be private enterprise, um, particularly job creation. Um, and that job creation is necessary because Africa is facing uh, a youth bulge. It's, uh, the, its demographics are such that there are going to be, there's so many young people now, many of the countries have 50% of their population under the age of 25. Um, and that, that youth, that youth is, if they don't have jobs, if they're not educated, then the prospects for Africa are dire. On the other hand, they are the potential, the tremendous potential is in those youth. And so um, I think that the demographic trends on the continent is also a key determinant over the next 10 years. And then infrastructure. Infrastructure is going to be key for uh, uh, private enterprise to really flourish. Um, and in particular, the continent needs to be, uh, get more power, electricity. You know, business can't grow. Development can't happen if you're constrained by power. Um, so infrastructure development, particularly power, electricity, but also roads, rails, telecommunications, et cetera, are going to be uh, key drivers and barriers um, for Africa's future. Now, when we come to the conclusion, there are some issues that I'm sure that you'll be interested in, and so I'll just you know, I consider them headline topics, and we can talk about them. Um, the role of China. I think everyone is interested in the role of China. The Arab Spring, and whether there will be contagion into sub-Saharan Africa coming from North Africa. And then, of course, South Sudan and Sudan and the conflict that's been taking place in Sudan. So those are some headliners um, that we can touch on as well, as particularly during the, during the discussion. Sky, I probably have, what, 20 minutes or 20 minutes? Let's, so, so um, and I have a whole dissertation here, so <laughs> let's get started. But when we look at economic growth and development, I'm going to really spend a bit of time here because in the past, the dominant image uh, coming out of Africa was of conflict and wars, hunger and starvation, poverty and disease. But I think the true new story is what has happened over the last decade and what hopefully will continue over the next decade. And that's really sustained economic growth from 2000 to 2010. Um, in the previous decade, 1991 to 2000, Africa lagged by 0.6% in terms of world, the world average annual growth rate, which was 2.9%, and Africa was 2.3%. But from 2000 to 2010, Africa actually outpaced the world's average growth by 2%. So the world was 2.6% and Africa was 4.6%. So it's actually outpacing world growth over this last decade. Six African economies were among the 10 fastest growing economies worldwide from 2001 to 2010. Um, these are probably statistics that you typically don't hear on CNN you know, and other uh, uh, media shows. Uh, but in fact, it has really been tremendous growth across the continent. And the expected outlook from 2010 to 2020 is that continued strong growth. Uh, the trend of Sub-Saharan Africa is that countries like Ethiopia, uh, close to 90 million people, Mozambique, Tanzania, even the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ghana, Zambia, and Nigeria are all expected to be among the fastest growing economies in the world over the next 10 years. Now, let's be honest. This is impressive, but part of it is fastest growth, which means they're starting at a low base. And so they're, you know, the, the growth rate is quite, quite uh, high, but African countries still are some of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and African countries rank at the bottom of the UN Human Development Index. Out of the, 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 the least developed 30 countries, 28 of them are in Africa. 
Um, and so that goes to show that we need this growth, this fast growth which is taking place over the last decade, but it has to be accompanied by actual development. Um, and that's really where um, the focus of attention over the next 10 years has to be. But what accounts for fast and sustained strong economic performance? There are about four major drivers that I'd like to point to. One is the demand for Africa's oil, gas, and strategic minerals, basically relatively high commodity prices. Now, this is a good thing from the continent, but it also leads a lot of vulnerability because you're vulnerable to world prices, and those prices can go down just as quickly as they've gone up. Um, the reason why I am confident of the next 10 years and that this commodity trend will be still positive for Africa is that a lot of that, that demand is coming from the fastest growing emerging economies like China, um, India as well. Essentially, trade with emerging economies now accounts for half of Africa's total trade. Um, so the trend that, uh, whereas Africa used to do most of its trading, and it continues to do most of its trading with Europe, with the United States, but it's now being reoriented to emerging markets and to fast-growing emerging markets like uh, China. China now has eclipsed the United States um, in terms of total trade with Africa. It's reached a billion. Um, so that's one. Much more encouraging than just prices, global prices, is the widespread macroeconomic reforms which have taken place in Africa. In 2010, 27 of the 46, uh, or uh, 46 sub-Saharan African countries implemented what are called ease of doing business reforms. And these are reforms that improve the regulatory environment so that African countries will be attractive for foreign direct investment and will be available and attractive for local entrepreneurs to start businesses. Some of these uh, types of reforms include the, the time that it takes to start a business. Um, so, for instance, in Liberia today, you can actually, uh, you have to be a Liberian, um, but you can actually start a business online like in the United States. You know, you know how we go and we just register our company and all of a sudden we have a business at least registered. Um, it's the same in Liberia today. Uh, registering property, the time to register property, the ease of getting credit, um, the protection of investors, actually people paying taxes so that the, the uh, state can have revenues to deliver services, the ease of trading across borders, so liberalization of trade, the enforcement of contracts. Um, all of these are part of the ease of doing business uh, reform index that the UN has, and African countries are more attentive to it, as well as doing better. And so those widespread macroeconomic reforms, keeping inflation low, um, liberalizing, are all part of the growth story and will be the basis for sustained growth. The third, the third driver of this uh, good economic performance, general good economic performance, and one that's, again, key to sustainability is the diversification beyond natural resources and the extractive industry. Some of the new sectors that are contributing to Africa's growth story are telecommunications, transport, finance and banking, wholesale and retail, construction, tourism, and agriculture. These are all part of that story of growth. And I'd just like to pull out two that I think are really critical. Uh, and not only just for economic development, but for the other interest areas that I talked about, governance and peace and security. And those two are African telecommunications. The, just between 2000 and 2010, firms generated more than 360 million new mobile phone subscribers um, in, those, in those 10 years. But still, there's a lot more room for growth. The penetration rate is still just 44% in 2009. Now, that's an old statistic. I need a better number because I know how fast it's grown even since 2009. Um, so that number is uh, higher. Now, why is telecommunications so important? One, it's a source of innovation. Um, African countries are actually leapfrogging 
and are the innovators. For instance, uh, mobile banking. We don't do mobile banking on our cell phones, but in Africa, they're seriously banking through mobile phones. Um, it's amazing what they're doing, particularly in countries like Kenya with um, a group called M-Pesa. Um, another reason why it's important is the issues of governance, transparency, transparency of procurement. Kenya also has a revolutionary system in which they've opened up their, their government books. You can find out anything you want to know about what the procurement rules are. You can find out what the budgets are in each of the ministries. It's truly amazing, and it makes a difference. And it's a key uh, tool for uh, addressing corruption. Uh, for instance, I was part of a process that I don't know that it was corrupt. I won't say that it was corrupt. But I was part of a, a process in Kenya recently for procurement. And we got back a note, this company that I was working with, that. Um, we didn't, we, we had, we weren't, we weren't, we didn't qualify because of their procurement rules. Well, I could go online and read all the procurement rules. And I wrote back a letter saying, which of the procurement rules don't we qualify? <laughs> I don't see anything that disqualifies us. And all of a sudden, whoever was in that trying to get us out of the way for somebody else to take, you know, to have advantage was caught. Because we could see transparently what the rules actually are. And so it's, it's, it's key to governance, it's key to uh, commerce, and also it's key to conflict mitigation. Uh, again, another Kenyan uh, group, NGO, called Ushahidi, is going around using cell phones uh, so that in elections they can give them to domestic observers who can take pictures when they see something that's not somebody stuffing a ballot box or somebody stealing the ballot box or you know something that's not proper is going on they can take those pictures it's the cell phone that prevented president mugabe from stealing the election in 2000 and what was it 2004 or 5 um, and the reason was they, the Electoral Commission posted the results on all of the polling stations. Um, and people went with their cell phones and took a picture of the results. And so, so there was a record. And so you couldn't just go to the Capitol and cheat and say, no, at this polling station the number was this, because there was a record um, from cell phones. So sort of citizen journalism and citizen activism is really being, is, is a key to a good governance and is the telecommunication story is part of that and I and I expect a lot more um, coming out of that you know it, it, the other thing is that one of the uh, people who helped with uh, getting mobile phones into Africa um, and in creating mobile phones is indeed an African a Sudanese um, you may have heard of him Mo Ibrahim uh, Mo Ibrahim was the uh, founder of Celtel which was the lead edge into bringing cell phones to Africa. Um, and now he is a billionaire and started a foundation on governance and gives a prize for good governance. And so it, it, you know, it, it, it really does, um, it can really be a, a key to transformation on the continent. Another key is agriculture. Um, there's tremendous potential in Africa and lifting people out of poverty so that that growth translate into our development and a reduction of poverty has to have agriculture as a leading sector. Uh, right now, the agricultural sector accounts for 23% of Africa's GDP, yet it employs 70% of the economically active population. It's estimated that Africa holds 60% of the world's remaining uncultivated farmland. 60% of the world's um, remaining uncultivated farmland. And so if we're going to feed the future, if we're going to deal with uh, food security and hunger globally, not just in Africa, but globally, Africa is key to that story. Um, what, what has to happen, however, is that there needs to be an, an increase in productivity. Right now, Africa has one quarter of the world's arable land, but produces only 10% of its total global output. Um, and so productivity has to increase um, in order to realize this potential for lifting people out of poverty and 
a food secure world. Part of that story is creating markets, um, creating greater transparency so that the farmer, who, are, who is often a woman um, on a small uh, plot, actually understands what the price of her, her crops are. Because right now there are a lot of trading middlemen who set the price for the farmer. And so the farmer is forced to be a price take taker. But if you can get commodity exchanges, if you can use mobile phones, if you can create that transparency, that farmer then has more bargaining rights um, on how she's going to sell her product and when she's going to sell it. Part of that is also the infrastructure again, getting warehousing, um, getting roads to market so that that female farmer doesn't have half of her crop spoil, right, because she doesn't have it properly warehoused. And so she's forced to sell it to whatever that trader sets the price at because she knows that in, in a month's time that crop is going to go bad for her. Those tomatoes are going to um, be spoiled. She won't be able to get them to market anyway. And so creating the market, commodity exchanges is one of the ways in which African leaders and African citizens are thinking um, about trying to help create this market and this greater transparency. Investment in agribusiness i.e. value addition is critically important. Um, and, and then finally, where do we come in? Fair, fair trading rules. Uh, right now, Africa's agriculture is depressed partly because our farmers are subsidized. Um, U.S. farmers, uh, European farmers, Japanese farmers are able to put their products out onto the market at a much reduced price because our government subsidizes them. Moreover, because of the food aid business, a lot of their cereals and grains are going, and maize is going into Africa, or corn, and is wiping out local producers. Um, so we have to find ways to fine tune uh, this international trade regime as well. So that's the, the diversification, um, particularly telecommunications and agriculture, are going to be key to that growth story. And then the fourth, the fourth driver is a growing urban middle class in Africa, basically increased consumer demand, and also the globalization of this young population. They have world tastes, and they have world aspirations. Um, and some of you g go to Africa, and you're on the bus in the airport or wherever, and you see these young people, and they have their Apple phone, and they've got their earphones on, and you know they, they, they look like a youth anywhere else in the world. Um, and they want what everybody else wants. And so that rising middle class um, is going to be uh, uh, create uh, higher consumer demand, um, will s help to mobilize entrepreneurship, private enterprise, and I think creates the basis for sustainable growth and development in Africa. So just to talk about the youth bulge for a minute, Africa's population is expected to increase to 1.1 billion by 2040. That's another number that I think is not right. I think Africa's population is already beyond 1.1 billion. Who's counting? And how are they counting? Right? I mean, really. You really have to, you know, as much as I'm giving you numbers, you have to take the numbers with a grain of salt, um, uh, particularly in Africa. There are communities that you can't get to. Uh, because of the poor infrastructure where nobody is counting. Um, but that 1.1 billion or 1 billion um, is the number typically given of Sub-Saharan Africa. And of that billion, Sub-Saharan Afri Sub Africa will account for nearly 30 percent of growth in the working age population. That's a positive democratic tr demographic trend. Um, essentially over the next decade, there will be more young people at working age than kids who can't work or older people who've retired from working. In fact, of all of the other regions in the world, Africa has the best demographic in terms of working age coming on, 30 percent working age. The, the world, when you look at the world total, it's about 10 percent. China, it's just 1 percent, just 1 percent. India is 15 percent. Um, so really, in terms of productive, working age people over the next decade, it's in Africa. The key, though, to, to that trend being positive is if those young people are healthy, 
and if those young people are educated, right? That's the key, because if they're not healthy and they're not educated, it could be the opposite, right? They become the insurgents. They become the easy targets for recruitment for terrorists. You know, they, they become, you know, the social discord. Um, they become the criminals. And so education and health is going to be key to Africa's um, sustained growth and development. What are the economic prospects over the next 10 years? I expect increased foreign direct investment, especially private equity funds. I know that they're going. I see them all the time. They're essentially running away from the U.S. and Europe because of the financial crisis, and they're looking for some place to put their money. Um, and they're, they're mainly going to emerging and frontier markets. And the, so far, the early movers who've gone into Africa have realized 30 percent in annualized returns. I, for one, think that's too much. I think that's too much. But for a capitalist, it's good. <laughs> it's very good. Right? So you can make money in Africa. Um, that's the point. But I want you to make money and do good as well. You know, do good making money and make the money do good is the way I would say it. And part of that doing good is helping to increase private enterprise on the continent and entrepreneurship in Africa. There's been a lot of talk about microfinance and providing, you know, small, um, you know, businesses. And you talk about small, meaning probably less than five employees. But how about the big companies that are going in now looking for that growing middle class? You know, you have, you know, a lot of major American companies now going into Africa, even on the retail side, not just the extractive industries, you know, the oil companies, but the retail side. Um, how about creating a supply chain and using African small businesses and medium-sized businesses as the, as the suppliers? Frankly, Coca-Cola has been doing this for quite a while. You know, and I think that type of model where the, the company doesn't come in and do everything and import um, you know, uh, workers from outside of the country, but rather help train and utilize local uh, entrepreneurs to do that, the type of su supply chain work that's going to be necessary. As I mentioned, the key challenge is power generation and infrastructure generally. Right now, fewer than 25 percent of Africans have access to electricity. Nigeria's energy demands, for example, are double what its power plants are currently producing, which is a drag, um, an obstacle to development. Another challenge is access to finance and capital. I think more regulatory reforms to create an enabling environment will help attract that capital. Part of that regulatory environment is stamping out corruption, zero tolerance for corruption, increase in transparency, and the rule of law will be key. Human capital development, I've already stated, health and education training is important for productivity and innovation. Um, and then political stability, that'll be a key challenge. And uh, in the past, when we talked about political stability, we were mainly talking about coup d'etats, military rule, civil war, authoritarian, despotic, one-party states. Uh, that's not exactly the story today. There's still vestiges of that. We, you know, we had a coup in, in uh, Mali. We had a coup in Guinea-Bissau just this month or, you know, this, just these last two months. Uh, we certainly do see um, some despotic leaders. That was what the Arab Spring was about in North Africa. Uh, and we certainly do see de facto one-party states in Africa. I would argue that even South Africa with the ANC is a de facto one-party state. Other parties are allowed to exist, but for whatever reason, whether they're unpopular, they're fragmented, they're harassed, they aren't actually making sufficient inroads. And so you have these dominant parties who continue to rule uh, for years and years. That's true in Ethiopia. That's true in Uganda as well. So that's the story of the past, though. The story of today, you know, but before I get to the story of today, there, there's, there's been sort of three waves of democratization um, in Africa. Now, the first wave came in the 1960s, independence movements from colonial rule, a lot of um, expectations and high aspirations. Freedom has finally come. We all, I wasn't born, but I was just being born, getting ready to be born. 
Um, but I still feel the spirit of the 1960s somehow, you know. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of hope. And um, it didn't work. You know, it ended up in socialist one-party rule, military rule. You know, it, 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 was a, it was a disaster, frankly. Not that the independence was a disaster, but the post-independence period, um, that decade was a disaster, or two or three. Then we had the second wave of democratization in the 1990s, and that's really the end of the Cold War, when multi-party rule again was attractive. You know, the Soviet Union wasn't propping up despots and authoritarian rulers. The United States wasn't propping up despots and authoritarian rulers. Um, and the, the leaders were subjected to civil society. Uh, and so you had this multi-party rule, which continues. The, 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 the story, the third wave, the story that we're in today is not about multi-party rule. It's about good governance. Um, the focus is really on the quality of the democracy or the quality of governance, and it's on increasing accountability of governments to citizens. And that's really what we need to do, and that's what is going to carry forward into a positive uh, next decade, is strengthening good governance. I, I even would put to the side the word democracy. I'm all for democracy, but multi-party rule is actually something that's Fairly, there's a fair consensus around multi-party rule now. We're not fighting that battle anymore, but we're saying it's not enough. You know, it's, it's about how well you govern and how accountable you are to citizens. Now, this is the interesting part about this, and this is today's story. The frequency of elections and the turnover of presidents is actually a challenge for governance in the short term. And that's a sort of bold statement to make. And, you know, and I know a lot of my friends in civil society and my co-editors of my book who are you know, civil society groups who focus on governance would say, what are you talking about? If, and if it's true, don't say it. <laughs> you know? But it's true and it has to be said. Um, and and, and what, what I'm saying is it's ironic, but these election cycles are actually leading to social turmoil. Again, I say in the short term, because over time you have to overcome this. You need these types of elections and, you know, again, accountability of leaders to their, which is the ultimate accountability is on election day. Um, you need that for long-term stability, but in the short term what you're having is the elections are robbing the budget, right? You're on this path to progress, you're putting away your money for the treasury, and then you have an election then the leadership says, we need to take money out of the Treasury so we can win, right? And all of a sudden, your fiscal discipline is gone. We saw this in Nigeria. It's not, it's not the only place, but we, we certainly saw this in Nigeria. In fact, Ngozi okonjo Iwela, who is now the finance minister of Nigeria, and you might have remember her name because she, was, she just ran to be World Bank president and was seen as the most competent and capable and qualified candidate, but, you know, the United States doesn't have an open governance process for selecting the World Bank president. <laughs> it's to be an American. Um, but in any case, she's really good. And she was the finance minister of Nigeria before when President Obasanjo was, you know, about to leave office. He wanted a third term. He wanted his party to win. And guess what he did? He moved her off the Treasury because of her fiscal discipline and put her as Minister of Foreign Affairs so that he could rob the budget, right? This is common. The same thing happened in the follow-on election um, of Good Luck Jonathan, in which they, the fiscal discipline that they were carrying out was put to the side um, for the benefit of trying to win an election. Secondly, um, part of increasing the quality of governance is about building institutions and strengthening the institutions. And the truth is, in Africa today, just 50 years after independence, the institutions are not that strong, and they're not so strong that they can mitigate or mitigate as well as, well as mediate social tensions. Remember I told you 3,300 ethnic groups, 2,000 languages, 54 countries, colonial artificially drawn borders. There's a lot of uh, ethnic fragmentation um, community regional fragmentation, and these institutions don't mitigate that very well. So every time you have an election, it's a zero-sum contest, right? And communities are pitted against each other. 
young kids who don't have jobs, young men particularly, are given some money because they don't have jobs. They're given some money and they're used as sort of the, what would you call them? You, you, they're used as the, the what would, agitators. agitators. That's the word. They're used as the agitators um, against other party members, for, you know, young youth from other parties. And so you have this social tension heightened around these elections. And the frequency of these elections means that social tension is heightened more frequently. You know, when it was, you know, 20 years before you had a president, well, you know, you know, the real threat was a coup. But now it's actually the mobilization of people, um, and particularly of young youth um, who fight each other. And that's a, that's a challenge of institutions. The other part of the institutional story is that the institutions now aren't, um, the institutions aren't, there, there's an imperial presidency. There's too much power concentrated in the hands of the, the executive. Um, and so parliament doesn't act as a sufficient check. Uh, local assemblies don't act as sufficient representatives of communities. The judiciary isn't a sufficient uh, authority to maintain the rule of law. And so these politicians are fighting for the presidency. Because when you get the presidency, you get the budget, you get you know, access to state resources, you can deliver them to your community. Um, so it's all about the presidency. And so part of the story of sustainability and good governance is about the, the delusion of power from the presidency into other institutions, both national institutions, the judiciary and the legislature, but also um, at the local level from the capital to the, um, to the periphery or to the rural areas in terms of uh, local assemblies and those local assemblies actually having meaning. This was something that I saw and sort of witnessed firsthand in Kenya after 2007 with the election with, uh, that went badly. The election was good. The counting afterwards was bad. Um, <laughs> people participated in the election. It was a good election. Um, but, um, it, you know, it, it led to a huge fight. I, I think you all know in 2007, uh, Kenya uh, had some of the worst uh, sectarian violence um, that that country has ever experienced. Uh, and one of the mediators who came in was John Kufour from Ghana. And John Kufour, his, his message to both sides, but particularly to the uh, 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 Rilo Odinga, the opposition, um, was you won the parliament. You have significant power. He wasn't saying you shouldn't want the presidency. But he was reminding him it's not all about the presidency. You know, there's also significant power in the parliament, and you can drive policy. You can drive the agenda of your country as the majority in parliament. And so until we get the strong institutions, and that's going to take time and it evolves over time, uh, these elections and the frequency of these elections are going to lead to more violence. And so we need to find out what can you do to counter that type of violence, and that's what the book is about, <laughs> preventing election violence, is it was indeed uh, a couple of conferences, one in Ghana focused on five countries, Liberia, Uganda, Ethiopia, Sudan, um, and Ghana itself, where uh, you know the expectation is you're going to have close elections. You've had history of violence in these countries, even though people don't know that about Ghana. Um, and what can we do now? to get their electoral officials, their security officials, their civil societies engaged in talking so that they can figure this out and work before they, they're in a crisis. And then it was also Liberia. We took it and went to a, a, did a second conference in Liberia in which we brought all of the political parties, again, civil society groups, uh, legislatures and others to the table to talk it out and to make a commitment uh, to not pursue violence um, in these elections. And, you know, thankfully, Liberia had a successful election. It was, it, it was tense. It was tense for a moment, but it did have a successful election. Um, and we're hopeful that Kenya will as well. So the problem of governance, again, is about accountability. It's about institutional development, but it's also about citizen responsibility. That's the third point. 
citizens have to be held accountable as well. S being a citizen has to mean something. And so it's about civic education, particularly to these young people, to say you will not be used as an instrument of violence for some politician. You will not, you know, take a few dollars or a meal or a T-shirt and therefore go out and beat somebody else up. You know, that's not what being uh, a citizen of this country means. You know, we have to change the norms and change the expectations around what citizenship means and make the citizens themselves active participa participants in the good governance, in the accountability, and in the stability of these societies. And so that is, um, so as that work is being done, and it's being done by NGOs, it's being done by the Africa Union, it's being done by the USAID and others, this type of trainees, the, the National Democratic Institute, uh, the endowment, you know, the National De Democratic Endowment, the International Republican Institute, they're all doing this type of training and this work to try to make these elections more reg not, not only more regular, but also uh, that they are well managed as well, so that they don't become uh, uh, sources of violence and social tension. And then when we to go to the third area, the final area is peace and stability, what's, and peace and security. What's the outlook uh, for Africa over the next 10 years in terms of peace and security? Most of Africa's conflicts in civil strife and crises of the last decade, um, you know, there were six major wars over the last decade. I'm now I'm not, I'm not talking about 2000 to 2010. I'm talking about 1990 to 2000 and into mid-2000. There were six major wars. Angola, you know, very long-running uh, conflict. The Democratic Republic of the Congo, people call it Africa's first uh, 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 interstate war, um, first world, they call it World War III-like, uh, because so many countries were engaged and involved in that war. Burundi, a civil war. Sudan, a 20-year civil war, two million people dead. Sierra Leone, one of the most brutal wars um, we saw that Charles Taylor was convicted today um, for his part in that war, and Liberia. So those were the six, six wars. None of those countries are in war today. Now, DRC still has insecurity in the East, um, that's for sure, and all of them are, you know, post-conflict countries, so they're fragile states. They're still fragile states, but the sort of horrible, horrific, 20-year civil wars, entrenched conflict, we're not seeing that on the continent anymore. Um, you, you know, Somalia is a failed state. And Somalia was a failed state 10 years ago and 10 years before that, and it probably will be a failed state 10 years from now, I'm sorry to say. Um, but the problem of Somalia um, and the problem that we do see in Africa and the real threat that I see over the next 10 years is terrorism. The terror threat is quite high. Um, and when we look at terrorism, we're really talking about uh, a, a sort of a arc that runs from Mauritania and West Africa across the Sahel. You think about the way Africa looks across the Sahel and down the East Coast with the horn being Somalia and the, the real center of gravity of terrorism in Africa is the Horn of Africa. And then down the Eastern Coast, you know, Kenya, even some Tanzania, right down through Comoros, and even coming up into South Africa, although the South Africans have responded quite well um, to the terror threat. Um, and the, the, key, the key actors there is, again, in East Africa, particularly in Somalia, is Al-Shabaab, a group called Al-Shabaab, which also was called East Africa, um, the East Africa cell of Al-Qaeda um, in Somalia. Then you have a group called AQIM. Uh, what is it? It's, what is it, AQIM? Al-Qaeda of the Islamic Maghreb, um, which is really a descendant of groups coming out of Morocco, but now have spread across the Sahelian region. And now a newer group uh, in North Africa, in, in northern Nigeria called Boko Haram, who may have hooked up somewhat with AQIM. I, you know, I'm not in the intelligence. I don't know what's going on anymore. I don't get the intelligence. But that's what you hear, right? And Boko Haram is um, 
really a threat because, again, Boko Haram, not because of their own capability, they attacked the UN headquarters and they've attacked, you know, I think they've killed, what, about 500 or so people now, around 500 people. Um, but they're a threat because of what they do to social cohesion in Nigeria. All of a sudden, the southerners are saying, those is Islamists up there in the north, and the northerners are saying it's because we've been marginalized that we're, you know, that you have these groups going out, you know, you know anti-societal youth and groups going out. And so I'm more concerned about the social cohesion um, of Nigeria as a result of Boko Haram. But the problem is really about porous borders, um, the size of Africa. I told you how huge it is, and it's also about a youthful recruitment base, right? And so it goes right back to the story, and you know, I, this brings us right back home, the story of private enterprise, entrepreneurship, uh, human capacity building, education, health, giving opportunity, and job creation. And that really is going to be one of the keys to addressing what I see as the big threat for Africa, which is this terror threat. Also necessary is to continue cooperation between neighbors in terms of intelligence sharing, working on terror financing, our govern good governance, hopefully ho reducing social division and economic marginalization. In other words, creating a more inclusive society. Obviously increasing police capacity, security capacity, including human rights training. Um, so the terror threat is basically a network threat and the response has to be a networked response. Uh, we saw the impact in Mali of, tr the, you know, the military is trying to fight this terror threat in northern Mali, not feeling that they're getting sufficient resources from the government, and what do they do? They overthrow a democracy in Africa, one that all of us, well, even me, I have to admit, um, held up as a model of democracy we were like, oh, you know, Mali's a model of democracy. And so that's where I will, I want to stop on that point, which is that as much as I'm, 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 I'm very confident about the prospects for Africa over the next 10 years, the truth is until the institutions are strengthened, and they're just 50 years old, um, Condi Rice likes to talk about this country in which we had a civil war, <laughs> you know, well into our history, um, until those, those institutions that are very young, they're as young as I am, are really strengthened, are able to deal with all the challenges, are flexible enough to deal with the challenges that that's, those societies um, are faced with today, any one of these countries, any one of them could fall. Any one of them are subject to vulnerabilities. You know, so yes, the, the prospects looking out for the next 10 years are very, very good, um, but these countries, all of them, including, I would say, South Africa, which probably has the strongest set of institutions, um, are really faced with major challenges and therefore major vulnerabilities. So I'll stop on that point and look forward to our discussion. Wow. A comprehensive uh, look at a continent and with a little entertainment from the Miller moth that's flying around the room. Uh, we have time for a, a, about two or three questions and we'll make the questions short and the, and the and answer short as well. Yes, sir. And I'm going to repeat for the benefit of Pikes Peak Library District. So. To summarize, it was really a, a, a series of hint obstacles to foreign direct investment. You know, why people don't invest in Africa, whether it's corruption or stigma or in unfamiliarity. How do we break taxes? How do we break through that? Yes. Thank you. Um, actually, the, um, the, the stigma is important. And in fact, if you have a neighbor that's in, in some type of crisis or conflict, your GDP could go down 2% because people believe that oh, it's, a, it, you know, it's your country. And so that, it, it scares away investors, that's for sure. But if you're bringing in large investment, um, typically these countries will give you tax breaks. 
Um, you can negotiate, you know, five-year tax. For instance, let's take Rwanda. Rwanda is a country which is very high on the ease of doing business. So it's a model country right now. It, it has zero tolerance for corruption. Um, and they start out with a five-year tax break. And they'll let you even roll over losses into future years of tax breaks. And so they are trying to encourage that foreign direct investment. Now, that's the ideal. That's an ideal country. Um, in many others, you really do... The best thing I would say for someone trying to invest in Africa is get a local partner, um, someone who knows how to navigate, or it doesn't have to be local, get someone who's been doing business in Africa who knows how to navigate. Um, but pretty much everything's negotiable, <laughs> for good or bad. <laughs> That's right. this, is a, this is a market economy. Yes, sir. Question relates to uh, the, the, right. the question relates to threats of global warming and the implications for Africa, which are, which are several. But what are the best practices? What institutions? What organizations are making a contribution in in addressing that problem uh, within Africa? That's a little harder um, for me uh, to answer and to identify particular um, organizations uh, that are working in Africa. I think that there's a I think that there's a growing consciousness uh, about uh, global warming and climate change. I know that you know that many countries feel that somehow they're going to be, they're going to get the um, the brunt of trying to fix the problem that they didn't break in the first place. You know, the industrialized countries are really the contributors to um, to global warming, and these countries now have to develop, and now where they're being told that they have constraints. Um, there's some hopefulness about carbon credits, um, uh, but um, I, I, I don't, I, I, beyond that, I can't answer other than to say that I know that there's a growing consciousness about it. Um, and so people are trying to, and corporations at least are mouthing the right words about environmental sustainability, you know, about uh, green, uh, good, you know, green practices and, you know, Yes. So what, when you say the effects of what's, are, you know, in terms of Africa, the effects in terms of like the weather patterns and water resources, water resources weather patterns, yeah. No, I don't, I, I mean, you know the, the now, ba yeah, no, the now river, the now basin river is a mechanism to try to deal with that, um, you know, on the, with the horn between Egypt and Ethiopia and Kenya, et cetera, et cetera. And it has certainly prevented conflict, you know, the impact of conflict over that. It's helped to reduce, you know, that mechanism of water sharing. There is some, you know, you know, the Ethiopians and the Kenyans feel they're being cheated by the Egyptians. But nevertheless, they're talking about it. They're not fighting about it. Um, so that mechanism has been uh, a contributor positive. Um, on, you know, the sort of floods that you see in, 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 in southern Africa, I, I'm not sure that, I, I don't know what's being done to, to, to mitigate the impact. Thanks for the question, though. Yeah. One question over here. Yeah. And we'll take three, we're going to take three questions in succession, and then we're going to have to call it an evening, I think. China, China is investing heavily in a lot of areas, particularly infrastructure. They don't worry too much about human rights. They don't worry too much about what they deal with and who they have to deal with. And uh, we don't tend to be doing a whole lot of it. Is that a problem? Are there threats to it? Why don't we play more? A whole range of questions. What are the implications? Sure. Uh, you're quite right. China doesn't make uh, a country's democratization or human rights record a basis for its engagement. It's, it's a double-edged sword. 
Um, and ultimately, I think that the break on that type of engagement by China is going to come from local groups, civil society groups in the countries themselves um, and across Africa. And we saw this in Zimbabwe when China was about to deliver a shipload of arms to Mugabe's government. Um, and uh, the workers on the port refused to offload those arms um, in South Africa. Um, and then the ship went to, to, to Angola, and they refused to offload them in Angola. Um, and so civil society said, we're not going to allow this to happen. Um, some, some local uh, civil society groups, trading groups, uh, market women are also putting pressure on their governments to put more regulations in place, including limiting Chinese who can come into the country, you know, but also limiting how they can engage in trade um, in order to protect themselves from the competition of Chinese cheap goods and Chinese cheap workers, et cetera. So though, again, it's a response coming from the society itself. And so I think that's the, that's the real key. China also is learning. Right? China, China gets cheated by corruption itself. Right? China's willing to do business, and, um, and you know, I, I, I mean, I have to say I respect some of what China's doing, a lot of what China's doing, frankly. Right? And, and, and I say that from the point of view of, I, I mentioned that one of the key barriers to Africa is infrastructure. And they're coming in and they're doing infrastructure. They're doing hydro dams. Some NGOs don't like those, you know, but you need power in Africa, and water is a resource. It's a major resource there. They're building roads. I know I don't like to bump around Africa on those, you know, those bumpy roads. I'm grateful uh, for the roads that they're building. You know, they're putting up power transmission lines. Um, so China's, and China will do it fast, uh, and um, they will do it anywhere. So, you know, some places where even some African workers will not go in you know, forest areas with lots and lots and lots of flies, Chinese workers will go in there um, and do it. Now, it's, it's a double-edged sword. You know? And as I said, China itself is learning. It's now trying to be more responsible in Sudan uh, than it was in the past. And so I, I expect that response, civil society, Chinese businesses you know, losing out on non-transparent deals, and Chinese uh, traders being kept out of Africa as a result of uh, laws that the government's put in place. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Quick question. It's a question of sustainability and development, I think, really, is if I understand your question. You know, the role of NGOs, external NGOs coming in with microfinance, various programs for sustainable development, often very small, sometimes very big, but sometimes very small, uh, versus, no, this is really stuff that creates dependency. I'm putting words in your mouth. I don't know if you meant that. This is stuff that creates dependency on the outside world, and they should really be doing these things themselves. How do, how do we do that? And we'll try and make that brief, because we have one more question here. That we're Sure. Briefly, I don't think it's an either or. Um, I think that you need both. I think Africa's part of the world, and there's no place else in the world that other people don't go and help, you know, and engage. And, you know, and, and there's no reason why they shouldn't go and engage and help and do business and do charity and do whatever they want to in Africa, as long as it's legal, right? Um, so the, the issue is being conscious of what one is doing. And sometimes you can't be that conscious in the immediate. Right, because you don't know what the unintended consequences of the action is. You won't, you won't know that for some time until you have lessons learned. And so it's just trying to be very conscious of not crowding out, right, but actually contributing to. Right? And that's why I'm saying food aid, you know, when people are starving, they need food. But when we dump food, farmers lose. Right? But, but there's a balance there. And this is, you know, I, I think a lot of what I've been saying tonight is it's about timing. Right? The timing of all of these elections, but yet not yet have any institutions. It's not to say stop the elections, but in, in, if you don't try to get the institutions up, the elections are going to, in the end, you know, 
actually squash democracy rather than contribute to it. And so it's all about timing. So certainly individuals, I think, I think individuals going to Africa, engaging, I don't see a downside on that. I really don't, because you're going to learn, you're going to build relationships, you're going to build networks, and you're going to beco become part of the community. Um, but broad practices, you know, we, you know, we all like to give our clothes to African countries, and then we, we, we undermine the apparel industry and, you know, small textile producers in Africa, because all these clothes are dumped. Um, but we mean well, right? We mean well. Um, and, but we now know better. You know, so I think it's that part of learning that's more important, but engagement I always support. I hope we know better. Damn. I have a question having to do with what you mentioned was the strength of Africa in the future, that there is this enormously large body of capable workers, well, I won't say capable, of, of workers. Mm -hmm. And you said the two most trying questions that address that large body is health and education. And the question is, as far as education is concerned, is stratification, social and economic stratification, how much of a hindrance is that? And the second one has to do with health. Uh, how much of an impact is the HIV having on the uh, health of that working population? Sure. So it's a good summary question. Dan passes the quiz uh, because he summarized the presentation. But, uh, but excellently, if workers are the future of Africa, a working population, but the two constraints, biggest constraints are health and education, to what extent is social stratification a hindrance in getting people access to education and on health, to what extent is HIV AIDS still a problem or is it a generational problem? So I've added those words in your mouth. And that'll be the last question. Well, thank you very much for that question. Um, I think on the social stratification and education, uh, right now, for most countries, there's un universal basic education. Um, so you're really talking about what happens after you, if you, if, if you, you know, if, you're, if your family lets you go to school. You know, you know the, the, the problem of school fees, which were really a, uh, an imposed policy uh, from st structural adjustment, frankly, the Washington Consensus, out of the World Bank saying you need to have school fees, that's gone now. Um, and so mostly you get universal access to education if you have a school in your, you know, or if your, your family will let you go to school. Uh, but at the higher levels, you know, people start dropping out as they, they go up. And so certainly social class, social stratification has an impact there. Um, but, you know, not everybody needs to go to college. Um, and um, so, you know, Trade schools, vocational schools, um, are extremely important in Africa to get a skilled population. Um, so I, I would, in fact, invest a lot more um, in those trade schools and those vocational schools. Now, one of the advantages that Africa will have as well is that there, as the, the, the countries are becoming more stable and more peaceful, there's a lot of Africans in the diaspora coming home. And these are world-class you know, workers, these are world-class managers, these are world-class entrepreneurs. They've been operating in the best of companies, you know, all over the globe, in the United States, in Europe, um, in China, in India. They come with all of that skills and that capacity. And as they come home, um, then you're also going to have, um, you know, but that, obviously, that return home can make some people jealous. They kind of want to come home with world-class salaries as well. You know, um, and, and all of that, you know, but it has to be managed. Um, I think it's just part of it. Uh, HIV AIDS has been devastating. It's been devastating in Africa, particularly in Southern Africa. Um, but across the continent, the, 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 le the places where it has had least impact are in majority Muslim countries. Um, and even in majority Muslim areas of countries, that's where the prevalence rates have been less. Um, but in southern Africa, the prevalence rates have been as high as 30, 40 percent. So it's devastating. It's been devastating. Um, luckily, we Americans can be quite proud of the role that we've played uh, from the point of view of our government and the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, which has actually provided for antiretroviral drugs to go into Africa for the first time. And I know we've got to go, but I'm going to tell a story. 
Um, <laughs> I have to end with You're the story, the <laughs> you know, um, especially in this audience. Colin Powell. I traveled with Colin Powell in 2001, May of 2001. Actually, I traveled with Secretary Albright, almost the same trip, um, in 98, 99, and then with Colin Powell in 2001. And we went to South Africa, we went to Kenya, you know, we went to Uganda, and you just saw people wasting away, wasting away. They had no access to drugs, right? And they were just dying, right? And there was just no hope. Um, but when we got those antiretroviral drugs in there from 2003, people's lives have been extended, you know, by 10, 15, 20 years, and it has made a huge impact. You know, the, 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 the number of people dying from AIDS have actually really gone down. But the problem that we've had, so the President's emergency plan had three points, prevention, care, and treatment. We've done very well on treatment, we've done very well on care, and we don't have a clue about prevention. Because we're keeping people alive, but we're not depressing the, the new prevalence rates. You know, more people are contracting the disease. And so we don't know yet how to do the t proper education campaigns or what is necessary to get the prevention. But we as Americans can be quite proud because we led on that. Um, we led, and it has made a huge difference for Africans and in the lives of Africans and in the lives of, um, of you know, the um, orphans. Because Condi Rice, I'll, I'll say another Condi Rice, um, Condi Rice always tells the story about her own mother who died of breast cancer. Um, but her mother, sh she was saying that, um, you know, she, her mother died when she was an adult, right? It would have been very different if her mother had passed when she was a child, right? And so if you can keep a woman who has HIV AIDS alive for that child to reach adulthood, so extending that life, um, is a hugely impactful uh, thing to do um, for all of the issues that we talked about, for you know, social commerce, for stability, for social cohesion, for all of those reasons. And a lot of those people are teachers, you know, they're nurses, you know, so there's that professional class that's so important that has been devastated by AIDS and keeping them alive has a, makes a big impact. So thank you for that question. And I think we're looking at one of the leaders. And I think we're looking at one of the leaders of that program. <laughs> we have a we have a, uh, a small presentation for you, but I'm going to ask our uh, vice president for membership, Karen Burkhard, to come up and make the presentation because she can. It's it's a much more personal one, and she can tell the story of it. Thank you. But uh, thank you so much for your remarks, and uh, thank you all, Karen. Thank you. Dr. Frazier, as uh, you know, the, I think all of us here and the Board of Directors of the World Affairs Council just wanted to thank you so much for coming to speak to us here today. We wanted to make a gift to you that was representative of our region. This is a book about the 14ers in Colorado, and it is a kind of co, it's a collaboration between Walter Burneman, who is a historian, and Todd Cottle, who is a local photographer here, and he lives here in Colorado Springs. So it's a pictorial. A uh, book with a lot of uh, history, and it's inscribed to you by Todd Cottle. Oh, wow. And thank so, you. thank you so much. <laughs> I hope you. you enjoy it. Thank you very much. You. Again, Jen, I thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. Uh, this has been a special occasion and a very special time with you, indeed. And uh, everyone, drive safely tonight. We'll get rid of the the moths and watch out for the thunderstorms outside. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.